Okay, our, our first speaker of, um, of this part is uh, Lawson Brigan. He's from the United States Arctic Research Commission and head of the Arctic uh, Marine Shipping Assessment and many other things. I've known Lawson for many, many years. He shows up everywhere. I think I could be diving in some geothermal vent in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and Lawson would show up. How are you doing, Marty? So he's a very, very knowledgeable guy and very interesting guy, so talk to him later if you get a chance. And he'll talk about uh, marine transportation in uh, the Russian Arctic. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Martin. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Arcus, for inviting me to speak. Uh, usually I speak on behalf of the United States government, the Arctic Council, wherever I am in the world, in some official capacity. Th these are personal remarks and personal overview of the Russian Arctic, so I, in fact, not speaking for the United States government today, but more as a scholar, interested researcher on part of the world that I've spent about 30 years looking at, the Russian Maritime Arctic. Lots of activity in the Russian Arctic today, and as you know, lots of activity in the Soviet Arctic, Soviet times. The image is one that you've seen a lot today and uh, previously, uh, yesterday, uh, 11 September, uh, 07, a vast area of the Arctic Ocean is open. We uh, put on this image, you can see that a uh, huge area is ice-free across the top of Eurasia. Nuclear uh, icebreakers, ice-breaking cargo ships in the Soviet era, modern ice-breaking ships today, ice-breaking ongoing in all of the rivers of Siberia. So lots of activity in, in the Russian Arctic. Lots of press here, and I don't know if you can see this. Uh, press on this image, northern Northwest Passage open for about 16 days. That got huge press last fall. But no one really mentioned that there was one area of the Northern Sea Route proper, Northeast Passage, uh, that in fact where ice interacted with the coast. So if you were sailing along the Northern Sea Route, you would need an ice breaking ship to make it across the top of Eurasia. I remind the diplomats. Uh, almost at every meeting, the senior Arctic officials, that in fact the uh, Arctic Ocean will be ice covered uh, forever, hopefully. If it isn't covered forever, we're probably all in trouble. The amount of heat to, to melt the polar ice in the wintertime is, it would be quite extraordinary for the planet. So it, the ice cover, although thinner, perhaps a little less, less extent from a navigation standpoint, access standpoint, the images in the winter are quite important and the rate of change of multi-year ice to a first-year ice uh, ocean is important again to, to navigation. But these images are hugely important. The ice uh, likely in mid-century could be 1.5 to 2, 2 meters thick. So that particular barrier for ice navigation for ice-breaking ships is uh, not necessarily a barrier, but a controller on the types of ships, extraordinarily expensive ships, maybe nuclear ice-breaking ships, so if you want to do this year-round, uh, you will have to contend with ice. Not something I have to tell you all, but the general public and even the uh, diplomats in the Arctic Council, you have to remind everyone it's not year-round navigation, and it's not year-round ice-free Arctic Ocean. It seems pretty straightforward to us, but it, but it is not to the world. Without the ice cover, of course, you still have to contend with a very complex part of northern Eurasia, large continental shelves, as we know. So this whole area is a very, very uh, complicated uh, navigation area for, for navigation. Picture I show in the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment briefs uh, of the complicated nature and the multiple types of routes that we're talking about, uh, cold climate but ice-free area of the Arctic Ocean in the wintertime, multiple routes here, very complicated routes here, connection between Murmansk and maybe Churchill, continental connection, uh, not transarctic, but intra-Arctic routes. So it, it, it is a complicated picture, and all of the different modes of operation in the Russian Arctic and across the Arctic Ocean. And this particular route seems to have some attention now because of the vast areas of ice-free uh, Arctic Ocean in the summer. This came from the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment of the 10 impacts teased out of the thousands of pages of work is, is this cartoon, this map of potential routes and access, what our previous speaker was speaking to, the access change, the sea ice retreat. But we will argue in the Arctic uh, Marine Transportation uh, Assessment that uh, 
that it really is global economics that's driving all of this marine activity and transport. The ice retreat, and I'll show you a few images related to the Russian Arctic here, is, is certainly gives us longer seasons in navigation, but mostly ice-covered waters, so the dimension is that it will be ice-breaking ships for a long time, if not forever, across the Arctic Ocean, which means an expensive dimension. Now, we've seen these images, this uh, plot before, uh, but it does show the relentless change of ex ice extent. And I hope you can see this. In 2002, I picked this image out because in 2002, a small expeditionary yacht, French yacht, made a transit across the top of Eurasia, about uh, a continuous transit, a little bit of ice condition, a little bit of ice in Vilkitsky Strait here. But this is an extraordinary voyage, a very small ship across the top of Eurasia in the summertime in 2002. So if this type of vessel can make this transit, continuous transit, larger, more capable ships surely can do it in, in the summertime. But this interannual variability problem uh, persists from a navigation standpoint, certainly for, for other reasons too, of course, and for other impacts. But this interannual variability problem is, is a huge one for marine transport, for the insurers, the investors, the transport system, and a analysts. This, this problem and here I've just picked out the changes in Vilkitsky Strait in ice conditions over the minimum extents of uh, the last, from 2002 to today. So one year there may be ice, the next year there might not be ice. It's a very, very challenging prospect, not only in the Russian Arctic here, focusing on Eurasia, but also in the Northwest Passage, Canadian archipelago area. But we've seen, of course, this is from Ignatius Rigor, UW work, the retreat or the disappearance of multi-year ice. So if you were to draw transarctic routes across maps of this change over the last two decades, you would see that if you had navigation routes and had the ships in the system today, you would surely sail north of the island groups across the top of Eurasia, uh, not necessarily in the central Arctic Ocean, but most of the routes are on the Eurasian side, just based upon the observed record and some simulated record of change of multi-year ice in this case and change in ice conditions across the top. This piece of information out of the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, models were crude. All of this information came from teasing out out of the G a GCM, one sector from Carrigate all the way to Bering Strait. People would like to know how many days can you navigate across the top of Eurasia, in this case the Northern Sea Route, and you can see that the, the, day, the numbers of days of ice-free conditions increase, and that's uh, extrapolated to mean easier conditions for ice navigation. Not easy, not easy questions to answer. The GCMs uh, poorly handle the difficult geography of the Russian Arctic, but it gives us some idea of increasing number of ice-free days. But it is likely there's so few ice-free days, so there will be nearly year-round requirement for ice-breaking ships. At the end of the Soviet Union, of course, a crash in the amount of traffic uh, along the Northern Sea Route. The high point in the Soviet record was here, 331 ships, 1,300 roughly voyages, mostly to Dinka, but a few voyages across the top of uh, Eurasia from uh, uh, Maransk through Bering Strait to Vancouver and to the Pacific. But most of the voyages were in the western sector. About a steady state now, today. Interesting enough, the data is cut off at 2003. There are no reports, no official reports of the number of vessels today in, in Russia. No annual reports of the Northern Sea Route. So it's, it's very interesting to try to get this information to, to even plot out. Russian icebreakers, of course, have reached the, the top of the world, 1977, the Arctica, and uh, since then, 71 uh, vessels have reached, uh, surface ships, of course, have reached uh, the North Pole, which is quite an extraordinary number. 28 ships, surface ships, in summer, the last four seasons in, in, in the, in the uh, Central Arctic Ocean. The essence of this information, most areas in the summertime have been reached by surface vessel. When we talk about potential for transarctic navigation, 
at least in the summer, there actually have been a uh, fair number of vessels operating in the central Arctic Ocean, but only one, the Sea Bear, operating in near maximum thickness of ice in the spring of 1987. So only one surface ship has operated in winter, winter light conditions in the Arctic Ocean. Lots of icebreakers in the Russian Arctic today, left over from the huge Soviet system, more than uh, 500 ships that were icebreaking capable. This is the number, essentially, of icebreakers, true icebreakers that remain, one container ship that's nuclear, nuclear powered. But you can see some 26 ships that uh, have icebreaking capability, some extraordinary. One new ship, well, relatively new, built uh, from 1989 to 2007. Quite a long build of a new ship. Uh, this ship is designed to carry more than 150 passengers on voyages around the Arctic Ocean, tourist voyages principally to the North Pole. The Northern Sea Route today, all of the activity is centered on the year-round navigation from uh, Norilsk, servicing Norilsk from Dudinka to Murmansk. This operation has been year-round now for 30 years. No traffic here in the last 15 years except for several expeditionary vessels. The technology is driving this western sector of the Northern Sea Route. New tech, high tech ships built, this particular ship built in Finland. It uh, sails stern first through the ice with azipods. Uh, interesting marketing here, right out of Madison Avenue, the Arctic Express. This is a Russian flagship, Norilsk Nickel is the name of the ship, servicing Norilsk. It operates independent of icebreakers. This is the Russian nuclear icebreaker Yamal, essentially following the track of the icebreaking carrier. The new mode of operation for Arctic navigation, we believe, and we'll report in the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, is using this technology to operate without convoy support. Hard to see this, this image, but no rudder. Uh, as a pod system is a trainable a thruster, essentially, with no rudders, and these ships do, again, sail stern first through the ice. Finnish technology, applied uh, Norwegian shipbuilding, Korean shipbuilders are using and building these, using the technology to build these types of ships that sail in a normal mode, bow first, and in ice mode, stern first. Significant development in the Petura Sea, driving marine activity in the Russian Arctic, all in the corner, the southeastern corner of uh, the Barents Sea. Stockman Field is up here. Extraordinary development, and for the next 30 to 40 years, we'll see marine traffic, high levels of marine traffic here in the corner of the Barents Sea, all headed generally westbound out of the northwest Russia to the world at large. Shuttle system, ships being built today, so investment being made today in Korea, Korean shipyards and Russian shipyards building a fleet of icebreaking ships that will sail between the Petura Sea year-round, ice conditions here in the wintertime, but year-round navigation to Murmansk, stockpile oil, and then carry it to the world, perhaps uh, east coast of the U.S., but surely to Europe in a marine transport system that is year-round in the Russian Arctic. Of course, it's year-round in the Russian Arctic, Maritime Arctic, but not part of the Northern Sea Route. The Northern Sea Route definition in Russian law is from Karagate east to Bering Strait. So it's the Russian Maritime Arctic in, in principle. News of a couple days ago that the Russian nuclear icebreaker fleet would be moved to Ross Atom, the nuclear company that runs all the nuclear power plants of Russia, kind of an extraordinary development taking the ships out of Murmansk Shipping Company, a century-old company that has a lot of experience running marine operations, to the nuclear power company of Russia. And the implications of that are unknown, but surely will be very interesting for all of us in the marine world. For the near term, a few points about uh, the Russian Arctic. It gets some press, the Northern Sea Route does. The year-round operation to Dodinka will continue. Norilsk is a huge taxpayer, the Norilsk complex in, in the Russian Federation, highly successful company, 
the largest copper nickel mine in the world, will continue to be so through the century. The marine operations is essential to, to that. There's no rail link all the way to Dedinka. So we will see that, that marine operations continue with non-icebreaking non supported system, all ice breaking, independent icebreaking cargo carriers, no need for nuclear icebreakers, no need for, for uh, support of any of the northern sea route apparatus, which is quite extraordinary, puts a little stress on why the Russians should need all of these icebreakers. The Barents Sea offshore drives the regional transportation system in the marine world. Uh, offshore development, Petrora Sea, the Stockman Field, and all of that traffic again, all of the cargo, we believe, will head uh, westbound to the world out from south, uh, west, uh, northwest Russia out. The shuttle tanker system I mentioned, the Federal Icebreaker Service, uh, one of the questions of the use of the nuclear icebreakers now being asked is why use these extraordinary national assets to take tourists to the North Pole. It'll be very interesting to see uh, in the future, now that these ships will be part of Ross Adam, well, whether they will allow that to continue. Certainly it was a moneymaker for Mermat shipping to keep the fleet alive, but the extraordinary expense of these icebreakers is very similar to what we have here in the United States. Who pays for these machines? They are expensive. I think we will see fewer number of icebreakers in the Russian Arctic as the decades unfold. North Pole tourist voyages, I've mentioned, oil and glass exploration of the Kara Sea, some exploration in the next decade and a half out into the Kara Sea. And then finally, very uncertain about transarctic routes across the Northern Sea Route. Many linkages of the Russian Arctic to the world at large, not only copper and nickel, uh, zinc, et cetera, hard minerals, but oil and gas, fisheries. And, and there is some role, perhaps, of pipeline across Eurasia. We see these, these images connecting the global trade routes to uh, the Strait of Malacca, Suez Canal and their relationship. Certainly a very short distance here, but ice plays a role. Ice breaking, expensive ice breaking ships play a role in the dynamic to see what might be taken, uh, taken advantage of for transarctic routes in the summer. So for the Northern Sea route proper, these are some of the issues that, that I see and others see about uh, the use of the Northern Sea Route, the size and comp uh, the, the composition of the icebreaker fleet is, is there are too many icebreakers today. So how many will the commercial world have, vice the government, to support any operations in the Russian maritime Arctic? The status and future investment is not clear, but huge investments are required to enhance the infrastructure across the Northern Sea Route, aids to navigation, communications, monitoring, whole list of of requirements that aren't being met today. Uh, ship technology will drive the use of the Northern Sea Route by independently operated icebreaking ships in the future. The key point of all of these really is the tariff structure. The tariff structure today in the Russian Arctic is too high. The structure of tariffs is designed to pay for the huge nuclear icebreaker fleet, which is not absolutely required for this operation. So a tariff structure that relates to independently operated icebreaking carriers would be more appropriate to the system of the, of the future. A few other issues, and then I'll, I'll just, uh, maybe the last one I should, I should really speak about. It, it, it appears that if ships would sail across the top of the world in the future decades ahead, the most likely route is in fact, right down the middle, when you look at the image last summer uh, of, uh, ice-free areas of the Arctic Ocean, very attractive to sail a ship uh, right across from Fram Strait to uh, Bering Strait. Two complicated geopolitical areas, uh, systems designed for marine safety, high tariffs, etc. It is very likely that this is the route of choice across the top. Just to speak, now, now I can put my hat back on for the Arctic Council, I guess, have some brochures. We have an ongoing effort in this Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment Scenarios Futures Effort. If you look on the PAME website, www.pame.is, you can see some narratives for this framework of which includes governance and natural resource development and trade. Our arguments will be in the assessment that while climate change and a whole host of other factors are extraordinarily important to marine activity in the future, 
it is global industry, big business, globalization of the Arctic, which is driving every single element of marine activity of the future of the Arctic Ocean. The governance line is quite clear. There isn't an appropriate governance system today to enhance marine safety and environmental protection, so the challenge is for the Arctic states to get on with it. The global maritime industry is in the Arctic today. We're not waiting for 2030 or 2050 to have ships with 4,000 passengers close to Greenland, large tankers, LNG ships being built today. So the challenge for Arctic states is to respond today with appropriate mechanisms to enhance marine safety and environmental protection. Thank you.